Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to this hybrid event, National Agroecology Strategies, Lighthouses for Food System Transformation. And it's wonderful to have all of you with us today, whether it's online or here in Geneva with us. Um, today's event is hosted by FAO, BioVision, the Agroecology Coalition, and the Food Policy Forum for Change. And this event is also part of the policy working group of the Agroecology Coalition. My name is Charlotte Pavageau. I work for BioVision on policy support, and I have the pleasure to guide you through the next hour and a half together. We were amazed by the number of registration to this event, more than 700. And I think it shows an incredible interest from all over the world, um, not only to transform our food system through holistic approaches that are respectful of natural resources, that empowers farmers and local communities and promotes social equity. But more precisely, it shows a need to reflect on policy frameworks and the role um, and coordinated actions. So the topic of this webinar is national agroecology strategy. It's a rather novel approach uh, to scale up agroecology within the policy landscape. And quite interestingly, uh, there is a real momentum in Eastern and Southern Africa to develop strategies that support a transformation of food systems through agroecological approaches. Now, we are lucky to have today a wonderful lineup of actors and experts who are the front line of developing those national policy frameworks from various countries. And we will touch upon the following questions. What are these strategies about? What are their objectives? And what can we learn on how to develop these frameworks? You also would have the opportunity to ask questions to our speakers and panelists through our Q&A box, so please don't hesitate to post your question. Many organizations, and more and more, are supporting agroecological initiatives, including dialogue and policy support and policy developments that are conducive to agroecology. And FAO is one of them, um, notably with its Scaling Up Agroecology initiative. This is why I'm very pleased to now welcome Dominique Bourgeon. He's the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. And as you know, Geneva is at the heart of many topics related to food system and sustainability. This is one of the strengths of those national agroecology strategies to tackle different challenges of food system and to bring a farm to plate approach. Dominique, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed. And Charlotte, uh, great to be here with a room full in, uh, in Geneva, but uh, an even bigger virtual room uh, with so many uh, indeed participants uh, in virtual mode and so many also people who have registered and will be uh, receiving all the all the, 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 the findings of this uh, of this uh, webinar today. And um, indeed, uh, the the topic of uh, of today's session is. Uh, really of very high importance, and we are delighted to be associated to that. And uh, as, as you know, FAO has been working on the topic for, for quite some time. And, um, and I would say that the key moment was uh, about 10 years ago uh, when uh, FAO uh, played a key role in facilitating uh, global and regional uh, dialogues on uh, agroecology. Uh, in particular, in September 2014, in response to growing interest in agroecology, uh, FAO has organized an international symposium on agroecology for food security and nutrition that was held in Rome uh, with the objective of assessing the extent and impact of agroecological practices, identifying constraints, and developing common priorities. The need to understand the specific local requirements and realities of agroecology as a matter of fact, led to a series of seven uh, regional multi-stakeholders uh, seminars. Uh, and, and the decision was made uh, based on the, the success of this regional seminar to hold uh, a second uh, symposium, international symposium on agroecology in uh, 2018. Uh, this uh, 
series of uh, you know symposium and, uh, and meeting at all level led to the launch of two important initiatives uh, to which Charlotte referred, that is the first one, um, the, the Scaling Up Agroecology Initiative with, uh, in collaboration with UN uh, partners, as well as the, the presentation of the conceptual framework on the 10 elements of agroecology, uh, which, was, uh, which was approved by the FAO Council in uh, 2019. Uh, another important tool developed uh, by FAO and a large number of partners is the tool for agroecology performance evaluation, which you probably better know under its acronym TAPE, and which has been uh, used now in a number of countries, including this one, uh, Switzerland, and which aims to measure the multi-dimensional performances of agroecological systems across the different dimensions of sustainability building a global evidence base on the performance of agroecology. All this work uh, enabled FAO, uh, I would say in line with the, the, the core functions that were uh, that are the, the center of FAO work, uh, to support member states in scaling up uh, agroecology uh, and accompany the transition to sustainable food and agriculture system. For example, uh, we work on policy processes and we provide technical support to the government who want indeed to embark into that sort of, uh, of, of journey. We compile and disseminate knowledge, science and innovation, really at the core of a knowledge organization like FAO. Uh, we provide technical assistance and execution in implementation of field projects with a particular focus perhaps on small orders uh, farmers. Uh, and we engage, of course, in global fora and, uh, and provide the FAO as a place to discuss all these activities. We are also an active member of the Agroecology Co Coalition. And in that context, we, uh, of course, uh, will contribute um, to accelerate the transition, the transformation of food systems through agroecology, um, supporting this coalition and the national agroecology uh, processes. Uh, in, in that context, I can say that we at the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, but as well as with our colleagues, uh, some of whom are connected online, uh, we are really pleased to uh, co-organize co and participate in uh, this uh, webinar today, uh, which will be reflecting on this forward-looking initiative from uh, BioVision and the Food Policy Forum for Change. And really, I look forward to a fruitful deliberation and to a uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, very interesting recommendations, and especially those coming from, uh, from Eastern Africa, where, where we are very active and, and keen to learn from the, the folks who are participating on that. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Dominic. And um, as you stated, there's really many ways to accompany <coughs> the transition of food and agricultural systems, and, and policies is one of the key levels. Uh, now, as, as countries are developing new policies, let's take a minute to, to reflect on the role of national policy frameworks and on the role of different actors. And so I would like to uh, welcome our next speaker, Paul Hornbeck, uh, who will give us his take on this topic. Paul is a member of the World Board in IFOAM Organics International, and more importantly, he has really in-depth experience when it comes to organic and agricultural policy and in advising governments. Paul, please welcome. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in such good company. Um, and I bring greetings from the World Board of IFOM Organics International and also from the organic food and farming movement. 4.5 million farmers strong worldwide, most in the global south. And we're very excited about today's focus on national policy frameworks for upscaling agroecology and for the front running work in East Africa. Um, like the FAO, BioVision, the Agroecology Coalition, IFOM really believes that sharing best practices on national policies across borders is one of the things that's going to drive change through agroecology worldwide. The peer-to-peer -peer exchange um, among policymakers and organizations in eight African nations there in October, which this outcomes brief is based on, you know, was really a great example of this. And there, those were some great days. Um, there's a lot of gold here summarized in the outcomes brief, 
um, and really rich lessons about both the how of developing national policy frameworks, but also the what of specific policy measures that can efficiently bring knowledge to farmers and develop supply chains and markets, uh, ensure availability of seed and investments, and not least invest in the farmer-led organizations and civil society organizations that are really key to implementation. And I think, you know, everyone's talking about food systems these days. It's a good thing. Um, but a lot of this is about more about really tweaking uh, the current food system rather than transforming anything. And we know that agroecology delivers. Um, we need only listen to the science to know that agroecology delivers on climate resilience, biodiversity, farm and rural incomes, uh, protection of water resources, empowerment of women and youth, and on food and nutrition security. And I would claim there's really no other focus area for policy or for investments that provides so many results across so many global goals as agroecology. But we also know that change doesn't happen on its own. Um, the transformative power of agroecology and organic food systems can't be mobilized without national policy frameworks. And this is true in Europe, in the Americas, in Asia, as it is in Africa. And having had the pleasure of working on behalf of BioVision in a, in a kind of a support role with ministries and organizations in Uganda and Tanzania, um, I'd like to just highlight just a few strengths of their efforts that others might benefit from. Um, first, uh, the very close collaboration and co-creation of policy between ministry staff and a very diverse group of civil society and farmer-led organizations. That's the solid platform for change with really deep roots. Second, uh, the recognition that no policies for agroecology or organics can be implemented successfully without strong capacity in the frontline organic and agroecological organizations that can really drive change. And I would in particular like to highlight the close collaboration in both in Uganda and Tanzania between organic and agroecological stakeholders on policy and on advocacy. Um, that too is a model for many other regions, building trust, combining efforts for national impact. It's really inspiring to see the diversity of actors behind these national strategies. And I would also say, this is inspiration for our global movements at large. Um, we are one family and together we are the strongest alternative to de degenerative food systems. Um, this work is not easy anywhere. Um, I hope that this outcomes brief is useful for national actors and creating supportive national policies. And I would really invite global actors that are with us today, also donors, whether multilateral, bilateral, philanthropic, to really look closely at the needs for support that are identified, both in these policy development processes, supporting them, and the recommended, and the recommended interventions um, that stakeholders have come with. We can only succeed by lifting together in broad coalitions, and preferably at the same time, um, and I'd also really like to thank the policy makers and civil society uh, and farmer led organizations that really generously contributed all their experiences and hard earned lessons uh, to the outcome brief. And thanks to BioVision also for pulling all this together. I can tell you as someone who's worked with policy development and implementation for more than 30 years, there's really useful in inspiration and tips in there for everyone, including myself. Um, so dig in. And thanks very much for, for organizing this uh, launch. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and thank you for those sharp messages on, on the value <clears throat> of developing national frameworks. Um, today's event is a culmination of an exchange we organized last year between policymakers and policy shapers from eight different countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, on national agroecology strategies. And as Paul mentioned, we summarize the key messages of this exchange in an outcome brief. Now, I have the pleasure to welcome my colleague from BioVision, Moritz Fergert, 
who is one of the lead authors of this summary brief. He's going to give us a few snapshots of this brief. Thank you, Charlotte, and uh, welcome also from my side to everybody. I have now uh, the great pleasure to summarize the main elements out of the outcome brief, which we named National Agroecology Strategies in Eastern and Southern Africa Lighthouses for Food System Transformation. As Dominic mentioned earlier, there are multiple organizations which are supporting agroecological policy efforts, and so is also BioVision Foundation. We are supporting national actors in Eastern and Southern Africa to, um, to develop and advance their agroecological policy agendas. So before we hear from the real protagonists which are, who are driving this change in Africa, let me present to you an overview of some of the learnings that we, we took from these policy developments and from a learning process, which was already mentioned, the peer-to-peer -peer exchange, that we co-designed with these prot protagonists last year. So we, before we dive into the brief's content, I believe it's important to set the scene and talk a bit about the context that we are in. What we observe is that there's real momentum in Eastern and Southern Africa, as it has been mentioned already, to develop these national frameworks for an agroecological agro transformation of food systems. One country already launched its strategy, another one is following this summer, and some others will also follow later this year. More concretely, as you see it on the map on, in the slides, there are four countries which are di at different stages of development of such national strategies. Zambia started its own process last year with the unifying objective of climate change adaptation and mitigation through agroecology. And what's interesting about Zambia's example is that the process was initiated both by agroecology advocates, but also by the, uh, by the national climate movement. So this really shows that these strategies have cross-sectorial cross -sectorial opportunities to offer. Then in Kenya and Uganda, governments and food system actors are, are working on the consolidation of their respective draft strategies, with Kenya aiming to launch its strategy by the, by the summer, and Uganda uh, aiming for a launch by the end of the year. Last but not least, Tanzania is the front runner in this group with, uh, because Tanzania launched its National Ecological Organic Agriculture Strategy, the NEOAS, last November. And now in Tanzania, the focus is on implementation and funding, which is a crucial element of these processes. Here, I also want to acknowledge that there is other developments um, in West Africa and Latin America, where countries are considering or already developing such national frameworks. Coming back to our, our core our focus region, what we see is that in these four countries where we see the development of national strategies, key food system actors play a really important role in these processes. These actors include farmer organizations, agronomic research institutions, private sector actors and civil society organizations that promote, that protect the environment or represent consumers or represent as well marginalized and underrepresented communities. <clears throat> All these food system actors either drive the processes or accompany the drafting process of these strategies to ensure that a diversity of perspectives are included in the strategies. So you might be wondering uh, what, what are actually these national agroecology strategies? Maybe first to state that there are different concepts, such as uh, ecological organic agriculture and others, which are referring to strategic frameworks, which are all aligned with agroecology. What we decided to do is to regroup them around the concept and umbrella term of national agroecology strategies. So how do we define these? National agroecology strategies are overarching, are overarching, sorry, yeah. Uh, overarching frameworks that strengthen a country's policies related to food system. They outline specific policy intervention that accelerate food system transformation through agroecology. These strategies can support a country's efforts to improve food security, climate resilience, biodiversity, water usage, the protection of soils or farm incomes. These strategies also contain interventions that target really the whole food system, all parts of the food systems. This includes agricultural production, natural resource management and governance, research and extension services, but also education, the development of value chains, markets, consumption, as well as food waste governance. 
So now that the context is set and the concept of national agroecology strategies is defined, I will summarize, summarize the, key, the brief's key messages. But before doing so, and this has been said already, but I want to emphasize that this outcome brief builds on the learnings that we collected during a peer-to-peer -peer exchange with 25 government representatives and civil society actors from eight countries, which you see on the map. And we also have a, a nice picture from the group. Um, these, are, these, these countries uh, are either developing strategies or really also in, in more and more interested in promoting agroecological policies and maybe in the future developing these strategies too. Let me now summarize some of the key learnings we could extract from the conversations we had with these actors in Nairobi last October. Well, an important question we asked ourselves was, why should governments actually choose to develop a NAS? Through the peer-to-peer -peer event in Nairobi, we identified together with the participants five main advantages that these strategies present to governments. First, they offer an integrated and holistic approach for tackling multiple food system challenges at once. Second, they involve different government authorities with, comp different, with relevant competencies, and they support coordinated action across government. This is notably the case through the involvement of authorities responsible for agriculture, education, the environment, health, or commerce. Third, these strategies are action-oriented, they strengthen existing policy efforts, and they set out, and this has been said already by Paul as well, clear policy interventions. Fourth, these strategic documents are participatory in nature. In the countries that we've, in the focus region and in the countries that we, we, we focused on, they're initiated through bottom-up processes and drafted through dialogue with relevant food system actors. And I think here it's important to underline that this really guarantees that in-depth knowledge, direct experience, and expertise related to different parts of the food systems are included in, in the drafting process of these strategies from, from the start. And finally, these national strategies also contribute to national priorities. These priorities can be common, such as food security, the strengthening of food security, but it can be also distinct priorities for each country. As we see, for instance, in Tanzania, there's a focus on the promotion and development of agroecological markets. In Uganda, uh, a key objective is improving economic viability. And in Kenya, it is to counter or to fight soil acidi acidification. Now you might be wondering, what do these strategies actually cover? Well, there are many ways policy developments for the scaling up of agroecology can be structured, but we propose as a four by four framework of strategic objectives. This is based on common objectives that can be found in these national strategies and uh, the discussion that we had in our peer-to-peer -peer exchange in Nairobi. Just a comment maybe on, on this. These, uh, this is not a, an exhaustive list. Of course, there can be also spe specificities from country to country with other objectives and the naming can also vary from country to country, but it still gives this 4x4 framework, gives a, a, a useful framework for policymakers to structure the work on the agroecological transformation of food systems. Why did we call it 4x4? Well, because we have four key objectives that cover the food value chain and four key objectives which are cross-cutting. The four objectives that are distributed along the food value chain are access to natural capital, and sustainable resource management, farmer transition to agroecological practices, the strengthening of fair supply chains and entrepreneurship, and the creation of strong markets for agroecological products and healthy diets. Looking at the four cross-cutting objectives, we, we define these as first coherent governance and policy across food systems, flexible and adequate financing mechanisms, capacity building of food system actors, and last but not least, the mainstreaming of social inclusion of women, youth, smallholder farmers, and vulnerable groups. Within each of these strategic objectives, these strategies contain concrete interventions. And I really invite you to, after this, this event, to go into the brief and, and look, look into this chapter, right? because we really defined and we, we took out some key interventions for each of these objectives. But just to give an idea, we 
two examples. For instance, in the Kenya, Kenya strategy, we have the opening up of existing subsidy schemes to agroecological farming practices, uh, and more specifically, opening up fertilizer subsidies to bio-inputs to provide alternatives to farmers. In Tanzania's strategy, another interesting intervention is the concerns public procurement interventions to buy agroecological products. Now, we also have our two other sections which are really interesting uh, in our brief, but which I will not be able to detail now. I just want to mention them. Um, the brief also contains a section on how to make interventions actionable and impactful and proposes methodological tips for the prioritization of interventions because these, brief, these, these strategies can really contain many interventions, so it might be important to prioritize. And then uh, the brief also touches upon, upon the important topic of resource mobilization for the development of these strategies, but also then for their implementation. So I really invite you to also check, check out the brief to look into these really interesting uh, chapters in the brief. So to conclude, um, we chose the symbolic image of lighthouses as these national agriculture strategies can be seen as lighthouse frameworks of the agri agroecological transition of food systems. They have the potential to guide countries through effective and targeted, yet comprehensive policy action. But what is really important is political support and funding. This is essential to our, to our, in our view. So we hope this, this brief will inspire and support policymakers worldwide to start their own NAS processes together with national food system actors. I want to seize also the opportunity to thank the co-authors of this, of this brief, as well as all those who provided precious feedback and general support along the journey, namely the GIZ, FAO, C4, ECRAF, Bombay Consult, the Agroecology Coalition, and of course, the 25 participants who are peer to peer exchange in Nairobi. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. And I'm really happy now and pleased to give the floor to some of those actors mentioned during the presentation who will provide first hand insights on the national processes. Thank you very much, Mart. And um, you can find the link to the brief in the QA um, box as we don't have a chat function for this event. And another quick reminder you can ask questions uh, to our speakers and to our upcoming panelists uh, also in the QA box. Um, so I would like now to, to welcome our four panelists who are four champions of national agroecology strategies in their countries. Uh, and invite them to, to turn on their camera. I will start with Alex Rakuba. Alex Rakuba is a commissioner for crop production at the crop production department within the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries of the Republic of Uganda. As we heard earlier, Uganda is currently drafting a national agroecology strategy. Uh, and Alex, you're one of the main champion and focal point within your ministry. My question to you is the following. Uh, can you tell us what are the main objectives you want to achieve through the national agroecology strategy in Uganda? And also what gaps does, does the strategy fill uh, in compared to, to other existing policy on food and agriculture in Uganda? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. And uh, just to observe protocol, uh, Dominic, and uh, from FAO, uh, staff from Biotic Vision uh, Foundation, uh, Maurice, uh, Paul, my longtime uh, friend, and uh, all of you participants and organizers, thank you very much. As Charlie said, Alex Wakuba, Commissioner Crop Production Department in the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries. We are happy to have been invited uh, to be part uh, of this event. We thank you very much for all the support, even to formulate our NAS and uh, our organic agriculture policy launched in 2019. But to the question, um, our NAS, first of all, is addressing one problem. And that is the problem of diminishing uh, biodiversity and natural resources degradation. So that is the key issue. We want to reverse the trend of biodiversity uh, degradation 
of natural resource uh, degradation, biodiversity extinction and natural resource degradation. We want to reverse that trend. And the key objective, overall objective, is to uh, actually we want to promote, we are promoting sustainable transformation of uh, the food systems in Uganda to ensure food and nutrition is security, um, uh, climate resilient uh, livelihoods and social inclusion for all. That's our overall objective. But we have specific objectives. For example, uh, number one is we want to enhance availability and access to appropriate inputs to foster production of food or feed and to transition towards sustainable food systems. Then the second one is that we want to strengthen research, innovation, and training in order to foster uh, the products, the ecological products and services uh, in uh, 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 ecological approaches. The third is that we want to actually promote value addition and uh, marketing. Uh, we want to uh, promote value addition and market access of ecological products and services to facilitate uh, sustainable consumption and transitioning towards healthy diets for all. And uh, the fourth is that we want to strengthen, uh, we want to enhance the social inclusion, social equity inclusion for participatory uh, governance in uh, the food systems. And then last, finally, the fifth specific objective is to strengthen social, not to strengthen the enabling environment for resource mobilization, uh, systems, and, and the structures uh, for ecological scaling up and transitioning. Those are our specific objectives. Now, what this NAS is trying to do is the NAS is coming to address uh, a void, a void in the policies, in the legislation, in the programs and plans of government, uh, which we have observed to be uh, lopsided towards conventional. And yet the conventional approaches, the conventional uh, supporting systems are the ones worsening uh, the ecosystem's degradation. So the NAS is coming to fill that gap, to beat that gap. NAS is coming to address that gap. And uh, although we have the organic agriculture policy, which is uh, related to ecological organic uh, agriculture, because for us here in Uganda, we observe that organic agriculture and agroecology are talking to one thing. The difference between the two is that uh, agroecology is wider in its scope. It has 13 principles that it addresses, yet organic agriculture has only four. So although we have a fully pledged and approved government policy, we are also entertaining and embracing agroecology strategy because it addresses a wider scope uh, of uh, food systems transitioning and transformation. Where are we? We are now at approval stages. We are pursuing approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And I think uh, your vision for this national agroecology strategy is very clear. Uh, so thank you for this. For those who are wondering, uh, we are going to share the recording of this event after after the end of the event, in case you missed some, some of its pop. Now I will turn to Mary Irungu. Mary is a policy advocacy coordinator at Pelum Kenya. And Pelum is a network of civil society organization working with small scale farmers with more than 60 members and is one of the key non-governmental organizations coordinating the development of a national agroecology strategy in Kenya. And um, I know, Mary, you just went through a very wide consultation processes in 47 counties in Kenya, so quite an extensive process of consulting actors. So can you tell us a bit more about stakeholder engagement? 
and maybe what was the role of different actors, both in the drafting and what is envisaged for the implementation. Uh, and maybe you can tell us what was most surprising during this consultation process. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Charlotte and the team. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share the process of uh, formulating NAS for Kenya. So in terms of the uh, stakeholders involved in the NAS, it started back in 2022 20, December, where we called the first visioning workshop that brought together key actors in the agriculture sector. This from the Ministry of Agriculture, the national level, and the county governments uh, represented by Vihiga County, uh, based on the fact that they had already initiated the process of agroecology, Moranga County and Busia, and also the civil society, mainly those who are promoting agroecology. And so out of this visioning workshop, a draft was formulated. And in Kenya, it is a constitutional requirement to involve the public. And therefore, uh, we had to engage the 47 counties, as you have mentioned. And the purpose of the 47 counties engagement is just to uh, create awareness on the process that is ongoing and at the same time to ensure that the process is enriched. So at the county level, we have engaged the farmer groups, farmer representatives, both those who are promoting agroecology and those who are promoting conventional agriculture, women and youth groups, civil societies, and also county departments of agriculture, environment, health department, as well as uh, academia. Uh, yesterday, we had also an engagement with extension officers and health practitioners, just to ensure that no gap that is left in the process of formulating the national agroecology strategy. One key thing that has been coming out and what has been amazing me is the fact that all stakeholders are appreciating the challenges that we are having in the agriculture sector and appreciating that agroecology is the best approach to address these challenges. And an interesting thing is the urge of the stakeholders to learn more on agroecology, as well as uh, get involved in the process. And this has been a key thing throughout uh, the 47 counties that we have been engaging. So um, it has been a, a key thing and the Ministry of Agriculture are the key stakeholders who have been taking lead in the process together with Intersectoral Forum for Agroecology and Agrobiodiversity. Charlotte, back to you. Neighboring country, Tanzania, with Janet Marrow. Janet is a Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Agriculture Tanzania, also called SAT. And SAT is another incredible organization engaged in responding to farmers' needs and to promoting agroecological practices. Um, we heard earlier that Tanzania already launched its national ecological organic agriculture strategy. And again, SAT was one of the key core actors behind the development of this strategy. So Janet, can you tell us what are the next steps for this strategy? And can you share some advice maybe to some of the other countries or other organizations that would be interested in developing such strategies? And I think everyone is particularly interested in the challenges you faced in that process. Uh, thank you very much, Charlotte, and thank you for fellow panelists, but also uh, the presentations from Moritz and also from Paul. Indeed, um, for us, uh, we are very happy as a country to to be one of the lighthouses or the uh, these uh, countries that at least have already a national ecological organic agriculture strategy, which is really paving the way for transformation and transitioning to more sustainable food systems. And uh, for us, uh, our process was very participatory and very engaging. And I say. Uh, it was it, we were successful as a country to have this strategy due to the very strong collaboration of various actors, uh, of course, with the government, uh, the civil society, but also farmers in the agroecology movement and network in Tanzania who were consulted and were part and parcel of the process of putting up a strategy. 
And uh, for us also know that the strategy was launched last year in November. And I have to say it was a process that took about uh, the actual actual work on the strategy took about two years, but before that, of course, you know all these um, efforts and initiatives to try and build the case for having a national strategy were in place. But the actual work with the technical team that worked to put up the strategy, it took about two years. And uh, with us having the strategy launched and in place with very good strategic objectives, we say now uh, it's time to put it into practice. So. We're one of the first countries to have a strategy, but also it's um, it's a challenge for us to put it into practice and make sure that we monitor, we assess ourselves as a country and as we implement the strategy and um, also as we, uh, how would you say this, as, as we implement the strategy and get to, uh, get to put into practice the uh, what we said we will do or what is written in the strategy and be able to evaluate and assess ourselves over time and see what progress we are making. Because if we are able to implement this very good strategy that is currently written on paper, it will be a big transformation and a big change for food production in the country, which will impact, of course, the farmers and the landscape in, in, in Tanzania. And that's that. Uh, one of the challenges, I think Charlotte, you mentioned also some of the challenges we experienced here, where our country is so big in terms of surface area and indeed to be able to have the representative, uh, a representation of all the country was a big challenge due to the vast uh, size of the country. But nevertheless, the technical team was able to go across the different agroecological zones and um, also the challenge of resources, as you've heard, it's a bit resource intensive as well. So this was addressed by looking for partners and supporters and collaborators to work together. But also some of the organizations uh, provided the facilities to be used by the technical team to be able to draft and put together the document. The whole team that worked on the on, on the drafting of the strategy worked on a pro bono basis so none there was no consultant who was hired or recruited from outside to do the work and we appreciate the support uh, that biovision provided but also paul hombeck who also did pro bono support to review and give comments on the strategy which helped to shape and polish the document also from the agroecology coalition thank you very much thank you janet so as I take this as a, as a key message to engage very early with as many partners as possible to mobilize different types of resources uh, to, to engage in this process. So let's take another perspective for our last panelist. I'm pleased to welcome Rémi Cluzet. He's a senior agricultural advisor working in agroecology at FAO. And through the FAO Scanning Up Agroecology Initiative, you have the opportunity to follow the development of agroecology in many regions. So looking at the bigger picture, Remy, uh, what role do you think those national agroecology strategies can play to support an agroecological transformation? And maybe to be a bit more critical, what are the limits as well of those strategies? And what maybe, what else should happen then? Hello, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, so yes, yeah, so first I would like to congratulate BioVision and the partners who are involved in this work. So as Dominique uh, Bejon said, it's been like 10 years now that FAO started the multi-stakeholders process on agroecology. This process will lead to the scaling up initiative on agroecology that we launched in 2018. So I'm quite glad to see what happened because I was organizing, attending, and drafting policy recommendation of almost all of the seminar we organized, like the regional seminar, the national seminar, and we could see this really strong expectation from farmer organization, and we're wondering, or oh, will, the, will the government follow, follow this process? Because it's clear that there is a lot of expectation. It's clear that agriculture is the center of SDG solution. So I'm really happy to see what happened now. So yes, to answer to your question about uh, what, can, what it can bring, of course, for me, there is a symbolic uh, aspect because I consider like it's a dynamic with lunch with the four country. 
already engaged and for other countries to be involved in the, in, in the region. So for me, it's a positive signal and that may inspire other members country. So for me, it's an important step for the institu institutionalization of agroecology, which is what we are trying to, to set up. And I already congratulate my colleague from uh, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, and Zambia for, for, for this work. Secondly, I will I think I will I will I will agree with what Moritz presented in the in the briefing. Uh, the key advantage. There are five key advantages. And I noted uh, initially that uh, yes, there is a pedagogic and strategic aspect. Uh, because and Charlotte also you you say that in the introduction, the agroecology offer an integrated and holistic approach because we tackle multiple challenges in one time. So for policymakers, it's a really interesting solution to move forward on, on sustainable development goals. After I will speak about the methodological aspect, uh, the, the brief highlights important aspect, uh, good practices to be used uh, when you develop a policy. So the multi the, the multi-sectoral approaches, the need for policy coherence, which is really, really important that we, uh, we sometimes forget. The actionability of intervention, of course, their prioritization. There was something really interesting uh, presented uh, in the document about the 10 criteria to support the actionability. I think it's a framework with really, really innovative and interesting. Of course, the funding mechanism, uh, including repurposing actual funds, as we should not forget, and the importance of existing uh, uh, exi uh, using existing instruments. Uh, Many, many, many times we realize we already have the solution in the country. We have the legal framework, but they are not implemented. So the question is why they are not implemented? What can we do to implement that and not to reinvent the wheel? Uh, and of course, uh, this process will definitely be useful to support agroecology institu institutionalization within FO work. So I heard like Paul Cole for global organization. It will be useful for us as a FAO in the scaling up initiatives, useful of course, but we will listen to Oliver, useful for the agroecology coalition. So, okay, man, now what about the limits? Um, the limit I could I could feel, but we need to, to, to dig a little more into this. It's a, about, um, on the methodology, it's about the diagnostic and the strategic approach. Uh, implementing a policy especially a transformative policy that implies a recomposition between actors, need to have a good understanding of what stakeholders can win or can lose uh, to address the power imbalance, the past dependency, the lock-in to avoid further blockages because you can decide something. Uh, I think in a multi-stakeholder consultation, things are said, but not everything. So maybe also separate discussion with actors to really understand the challenge I think that's something really important. Maybe it was done, huh? of course, because I don't have all the detail, but I think this strategic approach is super, super important in the, in the kind of, uh, of the policy. Uh, second, I will speak about the monitoring. Uh, it's important, of course, to monitor if action plans are implemented, but also how, because you can have little details. For instance, the subsidy for organic farming uh, which is really in, in Senegal, it was highly expected and the government decided to subsidize organic farming. Uh, but the question behind is, it can be transformational if, if the production is at national or local level, it empowers farmers. But if you buy this, this, this input from outside, from global company, it will be favorable for environment, but the, the transformative part will be limited. Uh, also, about the scale, in my role at FAO, I wanted to, to address a few things. So it's inherent to the national policy. Uh, national policy needs to be connected and reinforced at sub-regional and, reg and regional level. So Tanzania is working on ecological organic agriculture, uh, promoted by African Union, which is really, really important to connect to this. But for instance, in other regions, in West Africa, there is an important factor supporting the transformation is like a, a agroecological program from ECOWAS, so Economic Community of West African States. So there is a program uh, supported by European Union and the French Development Agency, and in Senegal, Mali, Burkina, Togo, Ivory Coast, that can boost the activities. Uh, in Europe, for instance, also, we have a comprehensive and transformative farm to fork strategy. We play an important role. 
And after the local level, I want to speak about the local level because in the Scaling Up initiative, we had two, flag we had two flagship act uh, activities in Senegal and in India in Andhra Pradesh. And it needs to be, it's really important that initiatives are grounded. Uh, why? Because it, it guarantees that you be build over time. It allows co-creation of innovating and holistic solution at territorial level. Uh, and also it can be a buffer is a government change. If there is decentralization on the field, we can also uh, keep the momentum on the ground. So this is also, I think, the different scale to, to address. And the last, the last thing about, about this is the need for evidence. So we spoke about the TEP tool, the tool for agroecology performance evaluation developed by FAO. Uh, we, have, we start by, we collect evidence in 50 countries. And I think it's really important to have evidence to demonstrate the effectiveness of agricultural approaches uh, for to build a political consensus, yes, yeah, first, but also to make the case for agroecology. So this is an important tool that can be that can be useful and deployed in in different country. Uh, and finally, uh, yeah, I would want to quote a few, but I won't go deep, deep inside of it. To a few process I can support. Uh, I mean the CFS, the Committee of Food Security Policy Recommendation, that are. Uh, being tested under the TPP Agroecology, the Transformative Partnership Platform in Agroecology, which can be, which can be of, of a really useful in this process. And I wanted to finish also with a process on family farming, uh, public policies. It's a decade of family farming. And maybe sometimes there are parallel processes because uh, building a, a public policy on family farming, uh, targeting small order may have many communities with agroecology public policies, but we are not making so many, so many bridges. So this can also can be an important aspect. Um, okay, uh, I think that's it. And sorry, I was a little longer. Thank you, Remy, to also highlight the need for better bridges between different policy areas. Um, so now we have about 25 minutes for your question from your, the audience. And I will turn to my colleague, John, for a first series of maybe two, three questions. In the meantime, you can still post your own question in the Q&A chat. Great. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Yes, there are some, there's a lot of activity in the chat, in the question and, and answer section in the chat. So that's really great. There are three questions right now. Um, once, what is the role of youth and gender or women groups in the development and implementation of these strategies? If um, some of the country representatives can provide some uh, insights. Second, what are the resources that are lacking? Is it financial resources? Is it technological resources? Is it capacity? Third, um, some of the questions are highlighting that there may be challenges in implementation because countries' policies may be contradicting each other. So how to ensure that uh, there is coherence between these uh, policies uh, at the different, uh, in, within the different national frameworks? in each of the countries that are here present. Great, who would like to, to take on some of those questions from our panelists? Um, I can take the question on the, what is the role or why are youth and women involved in this uh, process? Um, I mentioned in Kenya, we included youth and women groups in the county consultation forum as one of the principles of agroecology is on social inclusion and offering this opportunity to women and youth to share their insight and recommendations to the uh, strategy was key. And seeing youth appreciating the role that they can play in the implementation of the strategy and the role that women have in agriculture and seeing integrated in the um, agroecology practices. So it's more of inclusion of all uh, genders, including youth, women, men, in the formulation of the agroecology strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Maybe I'm gonna call Alex to, to give his take on the question on, on challenges of implementation and um, the fact that sometimes you have many contradicting policies in, your, in a given country. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, 
Yeah, that is indeed true. And uh, the challenges of implementation uh, uh, stem uh, from the policy formulation process. If in a given country, we don't have a coordinating uh, body to harmonize the various policies and uh, policy frameworks, then there will be a problem in implementation. In Uganda, we have the cabinet secretariat and uh, at cabinet secretariat, if it is a full uh, fledged policy, because we have policies and we have a uh, strategy. Policies reach cabinet level and they are approved by cabinet. Strategies may not go up to cabinet. They may be independent policy frameworks, but they are not independent policies that attract even government um, resource uh, allocation. But strategies, yes, they will also need government resource allocation, uh, but uh, the strategies may not reach cabinet and may not uh, attract cabinet approval. So there is a need for policy harmonization. There is a need <coughs> for policy harmonization during the policy formulation process. The other issue is, or challenge <laughs> is on, on funding on funding and attracting funding and resources and resource mobilization. That one uh, 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 stifles implementation. But coming back to my first reasoning, where if, if the policy has not been approved by the highest levels of government, then you are going to miss out on political will and, poli and mobilization. Mobilization of resources and mobilization of other stakeholders uh, to take part in the implementation of the policy. That will be the consequence if the highest level uh, uh, of governance is not involved. That will be the impact or the consequence. Now, I want also on my own, actually, to put in my own observation, and it is, goes to question maybe number three. Um, I we want to request that to request that at Rex, a regional economic community level, we need a coordination mechanism bring the various countries together, aware that various countries at different levels of policy formulation, in agroecology, some at strategy level, others at policy level. For example, for us, we say that organic agriculture policy and agroecology are talking to something related to similar thing, sustainability, sustainable food systems. So for us, we have just an issue of harmonizing the terminologies and concepts. Different countries at different levels of this policy formulation. So we need a coordinating mechanism to bring all the uh, regs, all the, the, the partner states, for example, in East Africa, bring all the partner states to some kind of uh, the same level. We may not be absolutely at the same level uh, of uh, maybe policy formulation, but at least of harmonization, we can afford to do that. And then interpretation and application of the various uh, terminologies. And I'm requesting at biovision level, at FAO level, let us maybe sit and come up uh, with a mechanism to harmonize the comprehension, the understanding and applicability of these various terminologies, because we shall end up being confused. And the people we want to buy into some of these terminologies may get lost. And especially our politicians, they may also get lost because today we are coming up with organic agriculture. Tomorrow, ecological organic agriculture, for example, at African Union level. Then the other day, we have agroecology. Then another day, we have regenerative agriculture. These terminologies here are going to confuse the people who would buy into what we are saying. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. And I think this call to focus on the regional level is, is quite clear and to, to maybe agree on a single approach, uh, or at least a single terminology. Um, Janet, would you like to, to react to some of those questions or what was said earlier? 
Well, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I was uh, looking through. I was looking through the questions, and it's it's quite a bit. So when I was giving my input, it was a big rain here in uh, in Morogoro. After almost four weeks without any rain, we finally have the rain back. Yes. Uh, so I see also some questions on monitoring. As I say, this is something that we 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 have to put in place and to proactively follow to to make sure that we are really implementing. Uh, that it's really uh, the, uh, the strategy is being implemented, that also the government is financially uh, putting in resources for the implementation of the strategy. And um, so in the end, also we can hold ourselves accountable, also our government and Ministry of Agriculture accountable on the progress and status of implementation of this strategy. And um, yes, uh, there, there are questions also to do with uh, the agroecology, transformation and more agroecology practiced uh, by farmers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, conventional agriculture, chemical inputs and, and, and hybrid seeds and all that, and also some of the uh, subsidy programs. Indeed, uh, I often say we, we don't see this as a competition really, because with experience, we have seen and observed the potential and the power of agroecology to sustain and uh, to sustain farmers and the farmers' livelihoods, especially in challenging times like what we're experiencing in the eastern part of Africa, with the heat waves, with the climate change and prolonged droughts, but also extreme rainfall and rampant rainfall at different times. So we see that with farmers who practice agroecology and who do soil water conservation, who um, who do mulching and add compost or farmyard manure in the soil that helps to improve the water holding capacity of the soil and preserve soil moisture, these farmers are better off. So for farmers like this, you know, they they, they have seen, they have experienced, and so they become uh, they, they become well aware about what is possible and what really works for them. So also they're able to speak for themselves and speak for what is right, and uh, without having to compete or to be convinced or for somebody to use a a lot of effort and a lot of work. So that knowledge, uh, that knowledge of agroecology and its practice is is the power, and this really far outcompetes any uh, any 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 other forces that really really come or try to come into the picture. I think I contribute that and let also the floor for some of the other participants. But also there was the thing on gender and uh, inclusion and. Uh, so first, with the the principles, but also elements of agroecology with inclusion, and also uh, here in Tanzania, I think if we are to make like a statistical analysis of the engagements and consultations, you will see at least a reasonable participation of both men and women in the processes of putting together the strategy, but also in the consultations, and. Um, also, uh, yes, inclusion of the different groups, also the young, the young people, some elderly people, but also special needs groups are very vital because the, the organizations which were consulted and which were part of this process, they work with these different groups uh, in the community. And so that engagement and involvement of the different groups is, uh, is, is uh, was considered or was part and parcel of the strategy development. Though I have to say, honestly, there is no dedicated budget or dedicated plan or programs that these are for maybe for youth or these are for special needs group. And uh, if we are to be transformative uh, gender wise, but also with inclusion, then we can maybe say we have also budgets and targeted activities for the different groups of people. So we make sure that they are really impacted and they're really reached during implementation of the strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. And um, most often uh, it's in the in the details that lies the devil on, on those concrete policy mechanisms on how really they are they are designed and implemented. I think we have many more questions. Uh, John or Hans? Please. Yes, we have, we have lots of questions. Thank you to the audience. Please keep your questions coming in. Um, we have a specific uh, question to uh, Remy. Um, there's a request to the FAO if they can support the monitoring of the Tanzania National Ecological Organic Agriculture Strategy mm -hmm. using the TAPE tool and provide feedback to the government and stakeholders for improving the implementation of the strategy. We have a question to all the panelists. 
um, asking if they could share insights into the monitoring and evaluation measures that these nat uh, national agroecology strategies provide for. Um, and we have another question to the whole how do we strengthen farmer participation in the process of developing national agroecology strategies? And how can we demand for public budgetary allocations to support agroecology strategies and plans, keeping in mind that most countries still are yet to meet the 10% public funding of agriculture? I mean, what questions? Maybe, <laughs> maybe you can start. Yeah, I can start with a question from, from Tanzania. So yes, of course, uh, it will be delighted to support uh, the monitoring evaluation of the, of the strategy. Uh, indeed, uh, we the tool for agroecology performance evaluation is measuring two things. First, the level of transition of agroecology using the 10 elements of agroecology, which are, are we are you have the same the same aspects of the 13 principle, huh? uh, just to not to add confusion, but we have 37 indices uh, that we are measuring uh, to to, de to um, decide a level, to, to, to find a level of transition of at, at farm level, also, also level and, and, and territorial levels. And the second thing we are doing, we are making a link between this transition agroecology and what is really important is the perf multidimensional performance of agroecology. So linked to the sustainable development goals. So is, the idea is to, to have uh, evidence on agroecology, but also this tool can be used for monitoring evaluation of a program, of a project, and a national strategy also. That's what we are doing now. So, so far it was at project level, and now we are working with the European Commission uh, to have a, a new version with indicators will be more adapted at national level and to assess this kind of strategy. So we are working on this and we will have a um, pilot country to develop this tool that can do, that can do this assessment. So um, Tanzania could be one of these countries. I will be, I will be really happy to, happy to, to, to work with, uh, with Tanzania. Uh, yeah, so this is my, my, I think I had only one question, right? <laughs> Thank you, Remy. Um, maybe let's move on to, to Paul. You would like to react to some of those questions, Paul? Yeah, just there's a lot of wise things that have been said, but just, just as a supplement to the last questions there, I think in terms of monitoring, we've tools have been addressed, but I think the the the, the stakeholder platform needs to be there. The, the setup for that, for continuous involvement of stakeholders in the monitoring. And I'm a big believer in simple processes for that, where all of the interventions are there and they're listed up and there's a status with regularly revisiting them. Is it red? Is it yellow? Is it green? Um, does it need to be adjusted? Does it need to be dropped? Then you get a much more agile process that's really rooted in um, the context and in the organization. So that's one element. And on the question of budgets, I think it's sort of the same response um, in terms of another question I saw in there about how to get national strategies on the agenda. Um, and it's I think it's about, you know, gathering intelligence about what's in the pipeline. So uh, there are a lot of platforms, what I would call ships that uh, new organic and agroecological policy can sail in on, like the national climate strategies, the national biodiversity strategies, some of these uh, agric agri agriculture strategies, food security strategies. So knowing what's in the pipeline, you can build um, uh, agroecological policy or even a request for a national agroecological strategy into some of those larger platforms that also have budgets. And you know, you can work for allocations within those, those efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um also would like to um, invite also participants that are in person with us. They are uh, welcome to also ask their, their questions. Um, but let's take Alex's take on, on those questions. I, I uh, Thank you very much. I just wish to uh, maybe uh, add something on what uh, Paul uh, said with regard to uh, the budgetary support. Uh, to me, if we involve uh, the uh, capable, relevant people in the formulation 
of these strategies or policy frameworks, including the agroecology strategy, I think that will go a, um, a long way in attracting funding. For example, we are at a planning stage. We are at the verge of developing our fourth national development plan. So it will depend on how active we are uh, in evolving, in attracting the planners to accept our agroecology strategy. So that is one of uh, the processes or the avenues through which we can get the uh, funding uh, support onto uh, agroecology implementation, strategy implementation. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, a strong message to, to really align your strategy to other, other plans that uh, are maybe more effective to, to attract funding. Um, I'm just checking from, from our panelists if there are other contributions or in this question. Uh, maybe, John, do, do we have other questions? We do have some more questions. There, there is a lot of questions, and I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to cover all of those. Uh, perhaps uh, one important question is what is the role of subnational governments on implementation of national ecology strategies? And how can these strategies address in, uh, participation barriers uh, for marginal groups or groups that have traditionally not been represented um, in or, or benefited by policy developments? Thank you. Maybe I will turn to Mary. Uh, in Kenya, we have this uh, strong role from counties who also are moving towards developing subnational policy. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, thank you. To start with, agriculture in Kenya is devolved or is a devolved function. And therefore, the county government, they have um, a big role in terms of implementing the key strategies or activities in the national agroecology strategy. And just to mention that, um, is that it is our expectations that after the launch of the strategy that counties will customize um, the national strategy in their counties based on the year context. But also to mention that um, agroecology has gained momentum in Kenya. We have counties that already have um, policy and an act, for instance, in Muranga County. We have the Rakanidi, Meru, Vihiga, who have already drafted an agroecology policies, and Kiambu, which are very advanced. And currently, we have other counties like Kakamega, and today I'm in Laikipia in a kickoff meeting. So I can say this is um, a process that has already kicked off in terms of customizing the agroecology in the context of county and they'll take up their role in the implementation. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm just checking if we have questions from <coughs> in-person in participants. Great. Um, anyone from the panel would like to take the question? <coughs> Barrier to participation. We touched upon a bit this topic already, but uh, I think it's still an important one. Yes. Um, the question is: What interventions does these strategies outline to um, overcome barriers for participation and inclusivity? So, concretely, in, in the current uh, interventions you have in your uh, NAS draft, uh, are there particular interventions that are? Uh, focusing on, on, on participation and inclusion of specific groups. Hello. Yes. I, Alex I, is too. Sorry, I cannot see you well. No, you cannot. Um, unfortunately, short, I think I have a network problem. Uh, but uh, I think for us in the intervention in number four, where we said what we are working towards enhancing social equity, inclusion, and participatory governance in the food system. Here, we are trying to open up to all uh, groups, stakeholder groups in uh, food systems to participate uh, in uh, activities of uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, land rights, food rights, and, uh, and land ownership. Uh, so by so doing, we think that we are opening up. We are opening up to all stakeholders to uh, get involved in food uh, uh, systems governance. That's the uh, what I can share. Thank you. Um, Mary, let's see it again. Yeah, Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Mary, uh, back to you. Yeah, um, one of the strategic objectives of the Kenya National Agroecology Strategy is on social equity, inclusion, and participatory governance in agri food system. And the main strategic um, approach is to facilitate access and control to productive resources by women, youth, the vulnerable group, as well as the marginalized groups and indigenous community. This in the aspect of securing access to productive uh, resources, as well as uh, scaling up interventions, which would allow women as well as men to better combine their reproductive and productive work. And also in terms of technologies that would meet the needs of women and men. And also in terms of the uh, financial products and these in, uh, in development and scaling up financial products that will meet the needs of both men, women, and youth within the community. Thanks right there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so maybe let's do a final round uh, for all our panelists in one sentence and one sentence only. What is your key takeaway from this summary brief and from this NAS process you are uh, driving or observing? Who would like to share their, their main takeaway from, from this? Janet, would you like to start? Okay, yes, uh, thank you. Well, for me, my takeaway first, I'm very happy with the lighthouses term. And when I saw when I saw lighthouses, I had to 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 look into what lighthouses means. And when I saw the definition, I thought, wow, it is true. And uh, national agroecology strategies are lighthouses. They're paving the way. They're showing the path. And this will be like. Um, the guiding, uh, the, 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 the guides for the agroecology movement. So also for me in this session, of course, uh, I was part of the, the session in Nairobi where we also had uh, people, stakeholders and representatives of organizations from other parts of the continent. And this coming together, sharing, exchanging, and of course the summary that was put in place after this session and the countries, we are at different levels. So we have countries where the strategies are in place and launched. We have countries where also nothing has started yet. I don't know for the different audience. I was looking, we have more than 200 participants or 200 people in this session. So from the different countries uh, we are coming from, what is the status? And um, also, of course, we'll be happy to share, to exchange and to cross learn as different countries also go up and put up uh, strategies, but most important is the implementation of these strategies to really have the meaningful good things written on, on, on the paper to actualize them and get them into reality and practice, which will be really, really, really great. So I look forward to working together, to collaborating, to spearheading and to uh, really transform our food systems, not just in Tanzania, but uh, also not just in Tanzania or in the region, but globally by taking small steps and of course supporting uh, supporting strategy development and implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. This was a very long session. Sorry. <laughs> um, Alex, would you like to, to share your main takeaway? Yeah, my takeaway is this. Thank you very much, Charlotte. I want to observe that agroecology, embracing agroecology is the only major pathway to sharing our communities, our populations into resilient, into resilient uh, coping mechanisms to climate change, 
and to sustainable food systems transformation. Thank you very much for this event and other subsequent events. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. Mary, would you like to share your, your main message? Yeah, um, our goal of all, all of us is to see uh, a change in the current food system. And one of the pathways is having an enabling environment, a legal environment, and so have the national agroecology strategy as one of the pathways. However, unless these strategies are implemented, uh, we are not going to realize this change. And for me, I look forward to seeing the implementation of the strategies. And in Kenya, seeing uh, the county government taking up their role, as well as the national government, all the actors taking up their role in implementation of the strategy to realize the change. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. And, and Remy, what is your uh, key takeaway? Uh, thank you. Uh, I will be simple. So for me, uh, I consider that we have a, a momentum for agroecology now and uh, that many resources uh, are already here in most countries. And I mean, uh, human resources, uh, especially, were really, really important and motivation. So um, I believe that uh, NAS uh, can... Um, as with the methodological support they provide, the participatory method they, they, they use uh, is a really inspiring approach that can catalyze uh, this process that could be developed uh, in many regions in the world. And maybe I'm going to share my own personal takeaway from uh, <laughs> Build This Outcome Brief, which is quite linked to actionability of intervention and to prioritization. Um, better 10 clear interventions than 100 good intentions. And it means that uh, a national agroecology strategy doesn't need to have uh, hundreds of interventions, but rather to focus on that good, um, actionable, and very clear and way, very well thought interventions that can be implemented quite quickly and where actors can focus on. So we're almost reaching the end of our event. Um, beyond Eastern and Southern Africa, we, we already heard that some other regions, some other sub-national governments are also developing uh, agroecological strategies. Uh, it's important to acknowledge those. And also important are broader international efforts to catalyze coordinated actions for uh, supporting agroecology. This is why I'm very glad to welcome Oliver Oliver Ross. He's the coordinator of the Agroecology Coalition for some concluding remarks. And the coalition brings together countries and actors from all over the world uh, to, to create a more coordinated movement. Oliver, you have the floor. Merci, Charlotte. Uh, thanks, everyone. For far too long, we have waited for agroecology to gain global recognition of its transformative potential. And the very fact that agroecology is now being enshrined in national policies by governments represented today is a testament that the time has come for agroecology, as Remy has said. We've heard it from various interventions today in Uganda. We've heard how national agricultural strategies frame around addressing the diminishing biodiversity and natural resources degradation, reversing natural resources degradation through sustainable transformation of food systems, linking it to nutrition, the healthy diets, Issues, as social, uh, issues like social uh, inclusion and innovative di innovation dimensions. In Kenya, we've heard how the drafting of national agroecology strategies has undergone an extensive consultation process with various stakeholders, including women and youth from the 47 countries across Ken uh, counties across Kenya, as mandated by a legally existing framework, the national uh, constitution and its devolution framework. So we have heard how this how these stakeholders are appreciating as well the, the, the challenges of agroecology and the need to address them. In Tanzania, it's NEONAS, which is two years in the making, I heard, and how they are trying to really address the representation challenges of making sure that they are able to cover the different agroecological zones in the country, counting on the expertise of those who are able to support, and sometimes asking for help means you know, really, really key. 
And counting on people who are able to do those things pro bono is a really, really important asset and um, an asset and resource that we should really uh, uh, take advantage of. So they are being mindful of the challenges to implement it and the future to assess it over time. We also have seen across these cases how participatory and multi-stakeholder processes is just as important as the final product. We saw in these examples how the agroecological principles and elements of co-creation and synergy are at play. Right? It's not always easy. We've heard the challenges. And I imagine as it is a matter of finding common ground and each stakeholder group being able to see themselves in the final product. But I think it's all worth the blood, sweat, and tears that you all put forward into it going through that process because the result is a greater buy-in and greater accountability. We also see the excitement and interest around agroecology at various scales. From these lighthouse examples, we saw how local context matters, reflective of how agroecology is site-specific as it factors local biophysical and ecological conditions and local social cultural context. These examples provide helpful insights of how other contexts, regions, countries can take place and be mindful of different specificities across different contexts. And as I've said globally, there is a political momentum. I'm joining you today from the seventh World Rural Forum in an effort to indeed build bridges we need to continuously elevate conversations, awareness, and um, I think commitment towards agroecology in various policy arenas to realize its potential. In July this year, the high level political forum will meet in New York to review progress made or lack thereof uh, in terms of achieving SDG one on ending poverty, on SDG two on ending hunger, hunger and other related SDGs. In September this year, the UN will have its summit of the future bringing world leaders together to forge a new international consensus on how we deliver a better present and safeguard the future. Also this year, we will see the Conference of Parties of the Three Rio Conventions. It's an occasion to really underscore how agroecology is crucial in fostering synergies between these Rio Conventions and their respective tools, land degradation neutrality, national biodiversity strategies and action plans, and nationally determined contributions. All these obviously have uh, implications at country level policy making and implementation. It's thus important and inspiring to witness today and hear the lessons learned in developing these national agroecology strategies in East African countries. One of the missions of the Agroecology Coalition is to ensure sharing best practices among countries and regions. We are really keen on taking these learnings to other regions to feed existing agroecology policy uh, or strategy processes uh, or support development of these new initiatives. And Remy mentioned earlier around uh, evidence. These national agroecology strategies form part of the evidence that agroecology works and that agroecology is gaining political support and recognition in the countries and communities where it matters the most. But of course, having policies is one thing, Implementing them is another, as what we've heard from the second part of the conversation. We have heard from Uganda some of the implementation challenges, which are linked to resource allocation, funding, policy harmonization and coherence, as well as coordination across agencies and stakeholders. This also underscores the role of oversight government agencies, national planning agencies, those involved in the ministries of budget and finance, etc., which need to be brought into the conversation because these are the institutions that hold the key to national coffers, right? Monitoring and, monitoring and evaluation of agroecology strategies. There are tools such as TAPE uh, that are available that can be used and looking at other multi-dimensional performance of agroecology. Equally important is the element of learning. I think when we talk about monitoring and evaluation, learning is key, uh, making sure that such assessments can bring um, knowledge and things that can be improved along the way using existing mechanisms, processes that are multi-stakeholder in nature. So we really look forward to having conversations in the near future in terms of lessons learned in implementing these national strategies. The moment indeed for agroecology has arrived. We are living it and how do we make the most out of it is our challenge. And I think it's our collective responsibility to make sure that you are moving in the right direction and that we are learning as we go along the way.
Asante sana. Thank you very much, Oliver. Especially thank you for connecting the dots between various discussions and various topics today and with a broader international agenda. Um, just I would like to reiterate that the coalition is a great network to join forces uh, to accelerate uh, an agroecological transition. And you can check their website if you're interested to join their various working groups and in particular one on policy, if this is a topic that you are really interested in. So just a big thank you to all of you for your participation. A big thank you to our speakers. We are really interested to keeping the conversation flowing on this topic uh, as new development um, arise and, and continues. So we hope to see you again. Do not hesitate to stay in touch. You can subscribe to our newsletters to get information and activities and news around agroecological food system transformation. Just simply have a great day and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.